Now, on August 1st, 2022, the University of the West Indies announced Professor Rosemary Bell Antwine as principal of the St. Augustine campus. With the announcement, Professor Bell Antwine became the first legal mind to be appointed campus principal at the UE of St. Augustine. Professor Bell Antwine is a Cambridge Pegasus Fellow, an Oxford and Commonwealth Scholar, and was named by the Caribbean Court of Justice in 2021 as a pioneering Caribbean woman and eminent jurist awardee. Professor Bell Antoine established the International Human Rights Clinic, an innovative legal education model twinning academia with activism and practitioners, and is president of the oldest NGO in the country, the Family Planning Association. Professor Antoine has an impressive publication output with over 17 books, texts, and published manuscripts. And this morning, Professor Bell Antoine joins us to discuss her tenure as president, her work as an educator, and plans for the institution, the UE. Professor Bell Antoine, good morning. Good morning to you and to all of your viewers. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. I know this was weeks and months of yes. phone calls and emails. A special good morning going out to Barbara because she knew how much I wanted you to finally sit with us here on the Now Morning Show. So first off, thank you so much for being here. You're more than welcome. Now, I know that you have been called many words, pioneer for one, because you are a lady of first. You became the first person from the Faculty of Law to win the Regional Award for Excellence in research after being nominated by your peers. You were the inaugural director and initiator of the successful Master of Law program, the UE's first multi-campus hybrid delivery program launched in 2002. And I can sit here and tell you everything else that you know that you have done. But I admire the fact that you're a lady of first, but you didn't start your career at least here in Trinidad. You were in Barbados. Yes. So tell us how you got to Cave Hill Campus and then what brought you back to the sweet island of TNT. Well, I, I, I went to Barbados to do law because at the time only Cavill did law, if you remember. So I was asked to lecture in 1989, and that is how I returned. I was, at the time I was in England, I just completed my master's at Cambridge, and I returned there. But I should say that I've always considered myself a Caribbean woman. Mm -hmm. So I've been all over the Caribbean living and working and elsewhere, but, and even my family background, you know, it's a Caribbean type of background. But I came back when they were starting a new faculty of law, and I was essentially pressured. <laughs> I think that's you say it. that with a laugh. Pressured <laughs> to come back. And so I said, OK, let me apply to be the dean. And mm. This that was at Cavill, yes? When, at, when this Trinidad faculty TNT. of law, because okay. you asked how, why did I come yes. back? I, I actually did not intend to, to return. <laughs> But um, yes, my peers, you know, oh, was we need you in Trinidad to help build this faculty. I went through the interview and so on. And I guess the rest is history. I stayed. And how long have you been here now? I came at the end of 2013, so mm -hmm. not that long. Yeah. I'm still sort of, I didn't sort of grow up in my um, formative years, young adult years in Trinidad. And sometimes I see some of the exciting things and I think, well, I don't know what that's about. That never happened when I was here. We didn't even have doubles when I was growing up. <laughs> we had Barra. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's interesting that you call yourself a Caribbean woman yes. because not only did you live in different um, islands, but you would have also done work in those islands. Yes. I just want to know how it compares. Let's take law, for okay. example, right? So how does law compare, let's say, to Mona or Cavill or St. Augustine? You mean let's the talk study about the program. of law? Yes, let's talk okay. about the programs, and then we can look in, into the broader context of law itself, the profession. Well, well the, the program is supposed to be the same. It, it, it's the same curricula. So that's fine. Uh, you have different lectures, of course. Um, the study of law itself and the practice of law should be and is to a large extent uniform. Right. Um, all of us have fused the profession, but um, we would have, every country would have some of their own laws. Mm -hmm. So the content might be a bit different. And I guess the way the legal profession defines itself and the way it um, conducts itself there would be differences as yeah. well. And I ask that question because I know we are all one Caribbean, but yeah. we are different cultures that we yes. have to, 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 to deal with. So I'm wondering how you would have been able to sort of move through those different there cultures. There are more similarities than you would think, but there are indeed differences. And that has been interesting for me. I consider myself 
that have been enriched because of that mm -hmm. experience, you know, having a good grounding, the Caribbean psyche, if you like. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then, so how were you able to use that sort of Caribbean grounding when you went abroad to study? Totally different landscape. Well, yeah, I am not, I, it, was, it was good of me, I think, not just to study, but I also worked at the ILO in Geneva for a while and lived a little bit in France. So I, I wanted those experiences simply to be experiences. I've never really wanted to live outside of the Caribbean, and mm -hmm. I still don't. I love the Caribbean, and people always ask, why are you still in the Caribbean? You know, so I think it's important to go out there to, to mingle, to work, to study with the first world, so to speak, the developed world that has everything at its fingertips, mm -hmm. and to understand that. But for me personally, this is where I, I feel comfortable, and this is where, as I said, I, I can live anywhere in the Caribbean. I say that all the time. But there's no doubt that it's a good experience. You do learn, you do have a different perspective when you're outside of the region. But what it is about the Caribbean, <laughs> Professor? Because you wonder. mentioned you are outside there with first world people. People consider yeah. us a third world country. Yes. But for some reason, you can live anywhere in the Caribbean. What yes, is that pull yes. that keeps bringing you back? I, I, I wonder. Um, it has to be, I suppose, our, well, the, the whole culture and the personality. There's a certain freedom that we have, a certain joie de vivre that we have. And perhaps also I feel strongly that we, not just me, but we have a mission to be able to contribute yeah. to your homeland. I think for me that's very important, you know, so it's more meaningful whatever I work, work I do here. For me it's more meaningful than to be a sort of a peg up there. Yeah. yeah. Now let's talk about that contribution because I know, well, I understand that you're a champion of health discrimination and gender issues. Um, I know that in your induction ceremony you also talk about environmental issues, but we'll put that on the back burner for now because I wanted to touch on this. You are currently focused on the injustice meted out to remand prisoners incarcerated yeah. for inordinately lengthy periods of time, including female murder accused. Um, and so you have a very, very strong uh, mm -hmm. thoughts on this and you want to fight for those women in particular. Why is that? Because it's unjust. I don't think anyone can now, maybe before people were a bit skeptical, but we've done some advocacy already. And I would like to think that we, we were able to be catalysts because more and more attorneys, which is what I wanted, are picking up the mantle. I see there was a challenge on bail and, and, and all different kind on the prison conditions and different things that people are looking at. But that particular issue is, is such an affront to our democracy. Um, bear in mind that these are persons who have not been convicted. We're not talking, talking about two years or three years. We're talking about as much as 21 years mm -hmm. awaiting remand. No self-respecting country could be proud of that record. So um, we launched the constitutional challenge. One of the things I did as dean of law was to bid for projects and grants to be able to do human rights type of work with my faculty and with NGOs and with practitioners. Mm -hmm. There's that um, twinning. And actually, the case is coming up next month, the actual trials. We've done all the preliminaries. So it really is a statement about our justice system. Perhaps we should say our injustice system. And so I do feel very strongly about it. Yes, some people may be guilty, but there may also be people who are innocent. You and I, any day, could be arrested for anything under the sun. And I don't think we would want to be sitting around waiting to be able to, hear, to, 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 to have our trial and the right to be heard, no. Yeah. And just to clarify, uh, Professor, the case that's coming up next month, is it, is it you against other people or what exactly is the, is the case? Well, we have with us, what we did was we partnered with attorneys. So I have Gregory Delson, is, Delson is one of our leads in terms of launching a constitutional challenge to the project, which is funded by the EU. Um, didn't just look at advocacy, you know, the, the lectures, the panel discussions, the, 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 the symposia and so on, but also for the first time launched a constitutional challenge in the High Court against the system, against the notion that someone could be for so long unduly delayed um, awaiting a trial, that that in itself is a human rights violation. That's the crux of the matter. So we've done all of the, you know, these days you have to do lots of preliminary paperwork before you actually get to, actually get to the trial. Yes. So the trial is in June. Yes. 
Now let's talk about some of the projects um, under your tenure. Great news. I saw that there was, was it a sod turning for the chocolate factory? Yes. <laughs> the a UV cement, chocolate factory? a brick laying. A brick laying for the chocolate factory. Tell us about it. Uh, that, and I really, um, I see myself as the facilitator and the builder uh, in this and many other projects. You know, I'm happy to be able to do what I can to bring them forward and to implement. That, that's my role. I, I, I think I want to be an implementer. I am. That's my personality. Yes. But the credit should actually go to the Cocoa Research Center, the CRC. And they're very dynamic, very inspirational director. Mm -hmm. Dr. Path um, Yumaharan, who has been working for many, many years, I always say they have revolutionized the cocoa industry because all of the chocolatiers and persons, including my best friend who's a chocolatier and an engineer, they've all been trained by UWE. It's UWE that started this work, um, one with the cocoa bean, ensuring that we have the number one and the largest seed bank in the world, number one. Of course, you know, we started with a great product, Trinitario, Coco, which is top in the world, and still commands great prices, but also um, that chocolate industry helping those who want to be chocolatiers and the farmers with, with technology, with know-how, with you know using the science and ag agriculture um, innovations to build that sector. So now, the UV uh, through the CRC wants also to be entrepreneurial. At first, we didn't start off being entrepreneurial. We saw ourselves only as the educators and the and the movers Showing and the shakers. How to do it, yes. uh, but now we are entering the market in this and in many other ways as well. That's our trajectory for self-sustainability. Nice. Now let's look at, an, at another project, because I understand is it that the U we signed, um, as was it an MOU with IDB, or there's a partnership with uh, IDB for some more projects uh, from UWE? Well, there are so many things happening, but um, IDB, I know, is funding the UE itself, not just St. Augustine, right. but our digitalization. I don't know if that's what you mean, mm -hmm. but yes. So yeah. there are many things that happen in the university. But there was also something with the environment, or, or is that one of your There are many, projects? many projects yes. um, that are happening with the environment. Yes. Um, and, of course, the University of the West Indies as a whole is... Mm -hmm. Again, people are not sometimes aware of these things. We have been leaders and indeed pioneers in research on climate change and all of that. We started many, many years ago, and the UN has designated the University of the West Indies as a lead university in the world on climate change. So whether it's Mona or whether it's Trinidad, um, St. Augustine, in particular, and even um, as, as KFL started solar many years ago, we have really excellent scientists. And it's not just scientists that are in uh, climate change, because I take the view it's multidisciplinary. You probably would have seen um, a newspaper series that I had started as principal, where various persons, academics, were writing about climate change, not just the scientists, those from agriculture. We even had somebody from the Faculty of Arts we had an indigenous person. So climate change is really multidisciplinary. Um, so yes, so environment has always been core, has always been key. We have many, many projects. There's someone, for example, doing research on sargassum. Right, you know, yeah. um, there, there are so many aspects of what we do, and the science faculty in particular, the faculty of agriculture, and reminding your viewers that this is the only Faculty of Agriculture in the UB and the region. It's something that I am very proud to see and to remind people. So a lot is happening. Not all of it comes through my office in, in a direct way. Of course, yes. But we do have our pet projects, if you like. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why I touched on the in, um, environmental one, because I know that's one of the ones that you're very passionate yes, about. Yes, I am. Um, now, you have received tons of awards over the years, Professor Bell Antoine. I wouldn't say tons, well, but... Well, <laughs> I will say tons, because I did some research on your background. It's a lot. But I want to point out one in particular. You were recently awarded by the Borough of Arima for oh, your yes. contribution, <laughs> right? And I know one of the jokes you made is that people will say, look, little Antoine running around. <laughs> and I know that you're not so little anymore. Right. But I mean, receiving all these accolades over decades of your career, and here you are being, you know, honored and appreciated by your hometown of Arima. How well, does that feel? Well, that one was quite special. Yeah. So I did make a special effort to go. I was a little surprised, as I told them, 
lifetime achievement. I, I felt kind of old, you know, so wow. <laughs> but apart from that, it was a very warm ceremony and I really thanked the mayor and, and, and the people at Borough of Arima. And it was very, it is, you're right, there's always something special when the people who you grew up with and your own hometown, when they acknowledge you and recognize you. So that was very touching. And indeed, um, after being away for over 30 years, the, the, as you say, the joke I made is that like when I would walk down, people would say, oh yeah, because they know my sister, yes, my brothers, and yes. apparently we look alike, I don't see it, but <laughs> you know, so you, you, you feel grounded is yes. one of the things that I, I have felt that I think, well, I don't know anybody in Trinidad anymore, I don't know. but yet when I walk around, people kind of know you, yes. you know, so that's, that's very comforting. So when you were little Antoine walking mm -hmm. around in a Rima, I mean, even back as a little girl, do you see, did you see yourself at this moment in your life now, you know, with the achievements, your publications, everything you've been trying to do, that implementer, as you mentioned? Right. I, I am, I, not specifically, but I come from a very intellectual family, yeah? So I had brothers and sisters who won national scholarships and who were that mm -hmm. sort of thing, you know, one is literature, one is a mathematician type of thing. Um, so I had, I, I think we were always expected to do well. And I certainly, for myself, did see myself um, in, in, in the sort, I was not necessarily saying what, because I think I've said before, I said I will never be a lawyer because everybody <laughs> said I'd be one. And I was a bit of rebel, but I always did see myself as doing something positive. Did you feel any pressure, Professor? I have to ask. You know, I had a very strange family. We've talked about it. My parents, and I'm not even sure I should say this because I don't want this to be the norm for other parents, but my parents never really pushed us. Sometimes mm. we think they should have pushed us more, <laughs> but we, we've had this conversation in my family. You know, but you kind of just expected, you expected to do well. And maybe it was example, I really don't know. My father was a, a ter terrific, read, always reading and sort of thing. My mother herself was a mathematician, um, a, a young person had skills, so maybe we just, they need the push. But um, no, I didn't have that sort of background where there's a whip and you must know. I didn't have that at all. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so, so I think it, there was an expectation, um, both my family and myself, uh, that we would do something positive. And it's not just academia. I have a sister who's a nun who is the head of Dominican convent, the world, worldwide, okay. you know. So even she has, you know, as a leader, so uh, and we were involved in community work, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I was in the Santa Rosa Action Youth Group, things like that. So I think there was always, I kind of always knew that I would do something with my life, but I'm not a big planner, so I couldn't tell I'm going to do this and that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not, that's not my style. So the so. universe has been good to you, Professor. I, I think so. <laughs> I always say, yes, I am very grateful. Yes, yes. yes. I've had my trials and tribulations, but I've had great blessings. That's good. Now, before you go, the 75th anniversary of UWE, any plans you wish to share lots on that? Lots of plans, Tell lots us. of plans. We've already done a few things. We've had a wonderful arts competition, which we about award the prizes. We had the UA, um, the concert. You will therefore organize a fundraiser. Some things coming up. Um, we want, we still want to have a procession of alumni. So mm. hopefully you hear more to be building up. We had a little setback in terms of the timing and now mm. we're a little nervous about the rainy season, but we still want to invite our alumni to work with us. And we're going to have a big gala. We had one for the sixth year. So we're going to have a big gala and, of course, research, research days and prizes. Research is key. Research leads development. Mm -hmm. So we're going to accentuate um, research. We had the big blood drive. I don't know if you gave it any coverage. We had um, Dr. Charles. Maybe we did. We did, April, yeah? Okay. yes, Dr. Charles. Um, we trained with the Ministry of Health to do that. So we lost some activities. So hopefully TTT will give us some great coverage as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Professor, amazing. I know that we usually do give you a lot of coverage, so I'm hoping that I can see you again at some of these events. But for now, thank you so much for making this possible. It really was a pleasure to pick your brain, even mm -hmm. though it was a 20, 20, 25 minute um, segment. But thanks again for joining us. Thank you, and it was a pleasure being here at TTT. And TTT, of course, is the one I grew up with. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is good to know. Thank you. <laughs> and that, of course, is Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine, the principal of the UE St. Augustine campus. You're on the Now Morning Show. We're going to take a break and be right back. Stay with us.